Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you uh, today to this second part of the topic of street photography. Um, I, I want to welcome any of you that are here for the first time and certainly also welcome all of those that are returning um, happy customers. So with no further ado, let's get started. Uh, I think you're going to love, I'm going to start sharing my, my screen. I wanted to start with this photograph because not only is it quite recent, um, it's as you can see in full color. And so one of the things that's gonna be exciting uh, today is that we're gonna be talking about that transition that happened largely in the 60s and the 70s where art photography did move from black and white to a lot of artists using color um, and so we're going to see a lot of very colorful photography today. Um, <clears throat> let's start with a little bit of a reminder of what happened last time for those of you that were not there, or just a recap for those that were. We talked about the fact that not all photography on streets is necessarily street photography with a capital S and a capital P. And the reason I say that is because street photography is really an artistic movement. Um, you know, you can have photography of streets that involves mostly the architecture. You could have a fashion photo shoot on the street with a model. That's not necessarily what we refer to as street photography. Let me tell you why. What we talked about is it's photography that captures kind of the mystery and aura of streets and public spaces. Human beings are key protagonists, but the thing about it is the idea is that it tends to be very spontaneous. So that's why when I say a photo shoot for a magazine, that's not so spontaneous. The other thing about it is that it really is about photography that doesn't have a documentary or photojournalistic mission. It's really photography of, you know, moments that happen in the street or in public places that might have gone unnoticed otherwise. They're not newsworthy in any way. And certainly we talked about how advances in camera technology enabled this over time. You may remember if you were here last time that we talked about what a huge groundbreaking moment it was when the Leica camera uh, arrived in 1925. Uh, prior to that, photographers, you know, had basically very large view cameras with tripods, very heavy, up to 45 pounds. Um, the light portable Leica from a German company arrived and it gave people like Henri Cartier-Bresson and many others the ability to truly move around the streets in a way where you could capture these kind of quick decisive moments, which you may remember Henri Cartier-Bresson coined that term to refer to the idea of, you know, with that camera, the photographer having the ability to capture that quick moment, for instance, this bike going by, or you know, these people in the moment that they're walking past these doors. Something we talked about last time is this really interesting lineage you can draw all the way from 1920s and 30s Paris, where you had people like Brassai and Cartier-Bresson and André Kertesz and many others working, and then how that kind of evolved and led to really the golden era of New York, street, New York City street photography. And, and an example of that is, is the way in which Brassai at night captured these you know, interesting characters like Madame Bijou here. And then someone like Lisette Model uh, captured both people in Nice and then in New York, there were also kind of interesting characters and eventually Lisette Model student, Deanna Arbus. The other thing we talked about, so this is still review, that's why I'm going a little bit quickly. Um, you know, there had been almost like a magazine aesthetic. Uh, Life magazine was pretty much uh, the magazine that brought, you know, the world to your living room through photographs. If you look at this really iconic photograph, though, 
um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a wonderful romantic moment. The composition is really quite perfect. There's no, nothing blurry, nothing really unusual about it. It's a very wonderful moment. When, when Robert Frank, um, the Swiss photographer Robert Frank went around the US and captured thousands of photographs, but he just collated and came up with a little bit of around 85 of them to be in his book, The Americans. Uh, this was shocking because it was an entirely new way of photographing. And as an example, um, you know, instead of, you know, nice, perfect composition, he gives us something like this young woman in a Miami Beach elevator. She looks really sad. Th there's a lot of blurriness, very grainy. If you look at the cropping, people are kind of cut off. So there's a very new, innovative way of photographing. And frankly, it's also a way of saying, you know, our world is not picture perfect. It's not the world of a magazine like Life. And this brought about basically attention to new photographers like Deanne Arbus, Lee Friedlander, and Gary Winogrand, and the curator of MoMA for photographs, uh, John Sarkowski, decided to basically set up a, an exhibition called New Documents in 1967 with the work of these three photographers. And what he meant by New Documents, again, is new ways of photographing, completely new different types of photographs that are, they don't look perfect, they don't always look happy, they are very blurry sometimes, the cropping is off, a whole new way of doing things. So that's where we finished last time, kind of acknowledging that we had arrived at this moment, this very important moment of a new type of street photography. Now, before we go on, I want to acknowledge that during that whole time with these major artists being acknowledged, there was this quiet introverted nanny who had been a nanny for 40 years, both in the North Shore of Chicago and then also New York. And she was only discovered recently after her death. Um, and there's a wonderful documentary if you're interested in seeing it called Finding Vivian Meyer. So Vivian Meyer, as I said, is this nanny. She took thousands and thousands of photographs and never told anyone. They were never shown, no one ever saw them, they were never presented. She gained zero fame, pretty much. And this young man bought a box of thousands of negatives at an auction in Chicago, just because he needed like old pictures of Chicago. And he basically unveiled all this incredible work. Um, so I wanted to show you because uh, it's kind of wild that no one knew her. And yet in this documentary, major voices in photography like Mary Ellen Mark and Joel Meyerowitz basically say these are pretty fantastic. Um, look at this wonderful image she captures of the men in their hats all reading the newspaper commuting in Chicago. It's, it's, it, it looks very mad men, right? It's, it, it was an era of, um, it was mostly men going to work. They're all wearing their hats. They all frankly look like they're practically wearing the same thing. And, and look at this white coming through the windows and, and the very white lights here. It's a really wonderful image because it's, it almost shows that incredible uniformity of all these men. They almost look the same, right? Um, here she captures what I would say is a decisive moment with this, probably a father taking some gum off a kid's shoe. And certainly she was around a lot of kids and families being a nanny. Now she used what we call a Rolleiflex camera. Um, and one of the benefits of the Rolleiflex is it's a medium format camera. It gets you a lot of detail, uh, but you also hold it down here and you look down. So you're not covering yourself and you know making it that obvious to people that you're taking their photograph. Um, you can kind of go by and look at them and take their photo, um, kind of like once you know that it's gonna be good. And I would argue that, that these 
are, are really quite similar to some of the work Deanne Arbus wound up doing that is very much about human beings and looking at them carefully and kind of with all their quirks and, and everything that they're about. And they're not always gonna be the happy, smiley people. I love this. The, the woman really doesn't look too happy that she's being photographed. Um, but as I said, I mean, look at this. And by the way, one of the things we're gonna do today is I'm gonna be drawing these comparisons between artists, sometimes between Parisian artists of the 1930s with much more modern artists in New York and beyond. So I hope you enjoy that because um, it's not to suggest that artists were necessarily copying each other. I think that there is a kind of uncanny um, similarity between what people see on streets regardless of time and place. So look at this incredible comparison here. Uh, Deanne Arbus photographed this woman with a veil um, about 13 years after Vivian Meyer. Now it's important that we talk about the arrival of color photography and I wanna qualify, it's the arrival of color photography in the art world, in the world of photographs at museums. Cause you and I know that photograph, color photographs have been around for years. It was basically the Kodak moments. It was just the little snapshots that we would take of our friends at a birthday, Christmas, whatever, but they weren't thought to be really art photography. They were considered, you know, every man's photo photography that, you know, you, you went and you developed the photo mat, you got your prints back. William Eggleston started doing color photography. He's someone from the South. He's from Tennessee, but was raised in Mississippi, so deep South. And he started using color photography and taking photographs that frankly were of almost everyday objects and everyday people down there in the South. Um, again, John Sarkowski, um, very influential curator at MoMA, decided, I like this and I'm buying some prints. And not only that, let's give William Eggleston his own show. And this is considered, again, a watershed moment in the history of photography because William Eggleston's color photographs were shown at MoMA. And it's considered the moment that, again, color photography kind of gained the respect of museums. Some of the photographs, I mean, it was widely criticized because people couldn't believe that the photographs were something like a tricycle. And so some of the comments were like, this is so banal, so mundane. And that was, you see the whole point with William Eggleston, it was about the beauty of the mundane, the incredible rich color and, and, and kind of raising this tricycle, as you see the vantage point is from below, it almost makes this tricycle monumental. It's like, let's look at it and realize what a wonderful symbol of Americana this is and how beautiful it is when you look at it closely. And, and, and imagine, I mean, this is just, you know, the boy at the local grocery store pushing the carts. Um, they had a print of this at the recent Christie's Photographs auction and I have to tell you, it's gorgeous. The colors are beautiful. If you see the lights falling on his face and arm and his hair is a beautiful color. And again, it's like elevating this supermarket boy to almost something that would have been like a Greek statue in antiquity. He's, he's this beautiful kind of beautiful, colorful boy and this woman walking towards him. And again, look at the rich greens of these booths at the diner. So it really is bringing these, these incredible hues and saturated colors to museums for the first time. Um, I should mention that what Eggleston did is he pursued labs that were doing something called dye transfer process. And this is an expensive process that at the time had only been used by advertising agencies and you know, to, to advertise perfumes and cigarettes and whatnot. So it had never been used for photographs of just mundane things like this. And so that's why 
you know, color photography in, in part was elevated because the actual quality of the dye transfer prints was unlike anything you and I would have gotten with, with our little Kodak camera. And Stephen Shore, I just wanted to mention, was another major artist, is another major artist that, that spent time doing color photography. And again, of some things that can look very mundane and very banal, um, but don't tell me that, that this is an incredible use of color and, you know, this young woman's pants are also green and you look at all the different wonderful greens in this car. And in fact, I will say a lot of these artists uh, that we're gonna look at that are using color happen to have cars in their photographs. And I think it's because cars lend themselves so much to kind of showing off their color. Now you might say, wow, Helen Levitt, didn't we already talk about her last time? Well, the reason I wanted to include her again is because she is one of the artists that not only transitioned from black and white into color, but guess what? She had been doing color photography even before Eggleston and Shore. Last time we saw an image like this, a wonderful moment, these kids a mirror was broken, they're, they're kind of leaning down to look at the shards, but again, black and white. Look at the year of this color photograph, 1959. And imagine the Eggleston watershed exhibition was in 76. Now what's really sad, it's an incredible story. Throughout the 60s, Helen Levitt had accumulated hundreds and hundreds of negatives in color and then a burglar came into her apartment and stole all of them. And so there are no 1960s Helen Levitt color photographs that I'm aware of. Instead, you'll see something like that. And then upon her work being stolen, she got back to work and started to produce again, a wonderful body of street photography in color, such as this one. So in a way, it's sad, it's like she was there first, but as, as it often happens in the art world, sadly, is that women were kind of didn't, didn't get the glory here. And everyone talked about Eggleston and she had been doing this work for a while. As I said, the color of the cars are really amazing. I love this photograph. Uh, it's really different and unusual. You know, Helen Levitt, um, has been linked to the surrealist um, movement. Uh, certainly uh, a, a photograph like this has the girl in such an odd position. It almost looks kind of like a spider, spider-like um, position. And how funny to think um, that kids today probably don't look for balls or toys as much as we did um, when we played out in the streets when your ball would go under the car, which is probably what she's doing. But I want you to see that, you know, her white cuffs match the white on the tire. And there's just this, this wonderful kind of series of curves and diagonals uh, that make it a very special photograph. And, and not only that, we, we don't see her expression, right? We don't know if she's happy, if she's sad, what's going on with her. Joel Meyerowitz is uh, also a major figure in street photography. Um, we'll talk about it, but eventually he moved to other types of photography. Um, but he too um, started out with black and white. And you know, street photography very often has, um, it's the idea of finding kind of funny or absurd things out in the streets. Um, here he bumps into a couple uh, underneath this, this kind of, cartel or awning at a, at a cinema. Uh, the, the movie is Kiss Me Stupid, which I looked up was a movie with Dean Martin and Kim Novak. And it just so happens that the couple is kissing right under that. So of course it makes it this, this really fun kind of kiss me stupid moment. And as all these people are going by. Um, and again, um, bringing that kind of idea of a decisive moment with a funny, a kind of a funny decisive moment. I love this image. This shows Joel Meyerowitz now again moving to color. And as I said, cars lend themselves beautifully to these rich, beautiful hues. 
and very saturated colors. Um, he went to the Puerto Rican Day Parade um, and sees this guy inside this car. And as you know, cars uh, for many years um, were kind of the symbol of Americana, you know, cars, Fords, Chevys, everything. It was a very American thing. And I think one of the things going on here is that this guy, even though he's a Puerto Rican that you might think, oh, is, is kind of a tough kid. I think Joel said, you know, he looked so sweet. He looked like the perfect model. And um, there's this interesting dynamic about, you know, the flag, the American flag being there, uh, which by the way, uh, was very often uh, a symbol that appeared in Robert Frank's The Americans. But the other thing is that there's this dynamic of, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, so I'm, I'm American, but Puerto Rican. Mind you that West Side Story had just come out, the movie had come out in 61. So I think there's this kind of interesting, you're an American, but you're a Puerto Rican American and Joel Meyerowitz is, is a Jewish American. So I think there's a little bit of this kind of, just the way Robert Frank was like the Swiss looking in, Joel Meyerowitz almost feels like he's also kind of looking at this a little bit as an outsider. Joel Meyerowitz actually moves to a much larger format camera. So he's willing to sacrifice the ability to run around to get lots of detail and sharpness. So here he's probably standing with a larger camera at the corner of 60th and Madison. And again, the idea is, you know, I'm capturing this moment that's really, it's not newsworthy. It's just, you know, people moving in a busy corner of New York. But again, it's got those interesting elements like the woman in red looking kind of big, like gigantic. Uh, these people almost kind of leaving the frame. And, and it almost looks like an, an accident is gonna happen, right? You know, cause busy New York, people do bump into each other if not careful. And there's this kind of somewhat gaudy architecture behind. So it's a perfect kind of street photography um, image because again it's it's kind of the mystery and aura of the busy streets uh not a newsworthy moment um and again using these really rich colors or here um again a funny moment where he bumps into these people dressed up as shoes i don't know if it was a promotion for a shoe store or they're going to a parade and this woman happens to have either a you know broken toe or broken foot and she's um <laughs> kind of giving them a little hello let's talk about meryl meisler uh she's a wonderful artist that has only started sharing her photography archive um in the last years uh this is because she wound up being a public school teacher uh, for many, many years. And when you see some of her for, for photography, she didn't always feel that it was necessarily the, the right photography for a public school teacher to have out there. Um, Meryl Meisler's from the Bronx, uh, but spent a lot of time in Long Island and commuting and going into New York, particularly in to see the nightlife of the late 70s. Um, and uh, I wanted to let you know that she has a, a show right now up in Syracuse and she calls this with the curator best of times, worst of times. And that refers to that period of the late seventies that she so well documents um, because you know she, she, she shows us the glamor and the excitement of places like Studio 54. Um, she was featured in the recent Brooklyn Museum show of Studio 54. Here she has this wonderful photograph of Grace Jones arriving at one of the opening nights at one of the clubs. And, and she has this, this gentleman, the jive guy, looking very dapper and, and, and ready for the night. Um, uh, again, but I will remind you that this was the time of the summer of the New York City blackout uh, in 1977, the son of Sam, the city was bankrupt, the city was very dirty, it was dangerous, the, the subways were full of graffiti. 
And that's why I love that she calls it kind of the best of times and the worst of times because there was all the greatest fun and glamour and disco music, but there were also some really difficult aspects. In fact, uh, Bushwick, which had been burned terribly during the riots and looting of, uh, of the blackout, wound up being where Meryl Meis Meisler was uh, a teacher. And she documents, now in color, again, moving to color, uh, this, this wonderful either friends and family kind of having a picnic. But again, look at the surroundings. Uh, Bushwick is not yet the kind of the cool happening hipster place to be that it is right now. It's quite depressed. Uh, here's a broken up car. Um, you know, the kids are playing practically in the rubbish. Um, and yet it shows this kind of, we know how to have fun. We can still enjoy a picnic even here. And I wanted to compare this to a wonderful image by Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, because again, there's this uncanny similarity. Um, it's, it's different color, you know, one is in color, one is in black and white, one is in France in the 30s, one is in New York in the 80s. But look how incredible uh, the similarity of people just enjoying, you know, a day outside. Um, and I thought it was remarkable that, that this man and this man almost look like they're doing the same exact thing. And the boat here is replaced by the car. And I love this image. Uh, this is something we don't really see much today anymore. Um, but it also speaks to how depressed this area is. You know, that a, a, a tire that this kid found becomes basically a toy. Um, and, and I know that parents today would not let a kid, you know, go around and around in a, in a tire like that. So a real time capsule. Elliot Erwitt is an artist that really did choose to go with black and white photography. By the way, if you look at the date, he's now in his 90s. Um, and Elliot Erwitt is really good at finding funny stuff out on the streets. He actually published five books about dogs. Um, and by the way, they have funny names, like one of them is Son of Bitch. Um, and, and what he does is, again, with cropping and vantage points, he gives us these really funny, you know, when you first see this, you, you kind of go, my God, what am I looking at? And then you realize this is a really big dog this is a woman wearing, you know, some boots, and then there's this little tiny chihuahua in his sweater and hat. So again, the, the, the vantage point and the cropping are really fun. And then this little dog in Paris, he catches him jumping up in the air. Or this image, um, you know, instead of focusing fully on the Thanksgiving Day Parade or even showing us a full balloon, he shows us, I think it's the Pink Panther, I believe, just coming, just coming around uh, the building and focusing on these little kids enjoying from their window. And again, to use a comparison, Robert Frank in his parade, Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, didn't focus on the parade. He focused on the people looking from their windows. This really iconic image by Elliot Erwitt is, is almost kind of the epitome of Paris being romantic. You've got a couple here silhouetted with their umbrellas. But of course, what dominates the, the, the image is this man kind of prancing or jumping uh, with an umbrella. And I can tell you, I, I lived in Paris and I think it's probably the most gorgeous city in the world or one of them. I, I certainly didn't see anyone jumping like that. Um, they look more like they belong in the, um, the cast of an American, uh, uh, an American in Paris. But in any case, it's a beautiful image. And here, I think Elliot Erwitt really is referencing and kind of having fun looking back at another Cartier-Bresson, which is this image we talked about last week with the man jumping over a puddle behind the train station. 
Bruce Gildin is an artist that is a little bit controversial. Some of his tactics uh, approach what paparazzi do. Um, in fact, they might even be a little more aggressive than what paparazzi do. Um, he is shown here, it's a perfect photograph of him because this is what he does. He, he jumps out, out of nowhere with a flash and takes photographs of people really close up. So he's really into close ups. And of course the people are not always very happy with him. They scream at him, they make faces. And there's this whole idea of like, how dare you take my picture? And, and he actually said that in his experience, Paris, for instance, was one of the places where people really got angry. They were like, why are you taking my picture? Uh, it's like a, a really an, an invasion of space and privacy. But the fact that, you know, you get their image without their consent is, is kind of a big deal. So look at Gildan's images. These people don't look very happy. Even having spent a lot of years going back and forth to Haiti, uh, this one's kind of outrageous because he goes to a cemetery to a funeral and manages to capture this woman who seems to be in probably an enormous grief. And also controversial, in 2016, he published a book of photographs, he calls it Face. These folks actually gave consent for their photograph to be taken. What's controversial is that he went around both the US and in England and found what I would describe as not the people that you would wanna necessarily look at for a long time or in, in a magazine. They're either very wrinkled, they're very operated. Let's just say it, they're not the most attractive individuals. Um, some said, you know, this is ex exploitation, this is outrageous, how could you do this? Others say, you know what, it's about showing the reality of people in life as it is. Again, you know, it's not always the perfect Instagram photo that you took 10 times to get just right. This shows all the creases, all the defects. This young man clearly has terrible acne. Um, you could argue that it's not that different from the criticism Deanne Arbus received when she was photographing people that were either unusual or on the fringes or this one we saw last week. You know, not the most attractive young man. I really like the work of Martin Parr. Uh, now we're going global. We're gonna go across the pond over to the UK. Um, I want you to see his quote here. He says, the fundamental thing I'm exploring constantly is the difference between the mythology of the place and the reality of it. So let's talk about this kind of reality of a place versus the mythology. You know, he spent time in a place called New Brighton, England. This is on the coast west of Manchester. It's a very working class, very white part of England. And when people have time for leisure, they go to what they basically call the, 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 the shore. But mind you, the shore um, is, it's not really, you know, beautiful sand. People are laying out in concrete. His photographs often have babies screaming. They often have garbage. And what's wild is, you know, they're in these beautiful, wonderful colors that, you know, the colors are gorgeous, but the place is again like, wow, you really want to hang out here? Um, in a way, it's a commentary on the lengths to which the working class will go to enjoy the seaside. Um, and, and they will be willing to go to a place that's far from idyllic. Um, look at what he does. He shows us these people surrounded by garbage, again, screaming child. Look at this, I mean, very full of garbage, of this man kind of with this beer belly. Many criticized this work. They said this was outrageous. How can a Brit be taking these photographs that are almost a criticism of the working class? He defended 
it as not being about class, that this is just about going around and taking photographs of, of people in Britain. Now, what he did do though, is he also went to the other extreme and gives us these beautiful photographs of people at the races, at the polo match. So it, it's hard to say that you're not doing a little bit of class comparing. Um, and then what he did recently, which is really quite interesting, um, he went to uh, an area of England that is one of the areas that's most dominated by people that wanted to leave the EU. So very English, very proud of their English heritage. And he captures this moment of these people and young girls on St. George's Day, extremely proud of being English. And, and, and look at this man's tattoo, you know, English and proud. And don't tell me that these girls, you know, instead of being smiley and happy, they almost have this kind of like, what are you looking at? Yes, we're proud English people and we want to leave the EU. Um, so there's almost this su suggestion that it's, it's nationalism, but with kind of that little bit of xenophobia that came into play with anti-immigrant sentiment. A very different photographer in the UK, Joshua, ja Joshua K. Jackson. Um, I really like this work, it's quite recent. This guy, Joshua, basically was an insomniac. He could not sleep and he wandered around the streets of Soho in London for three years taking photographs. And if you know London and you know Soho, it's a very busy kind of entertainment district of London. It's right by the West End theaters. There's a lot of bars and clubs and late night eateries. And, and therefore it's full of people near and around neon lights and, and glass windows and there's smoking and there's fog and there's, and he creates these images that are in a way look very, they're very colorful. And yet they almost give you this atmosphere of a little bit of late night loneliness and isolation. You know, the people aren't laughing and having the best time. There's, there's a real mood here that he sets. And again, when you've got these people behind these fogged up kind of wet glass, it, you know, glass windows, it creates this kind of atmospheric loneliness and isolation. In fact, when I saw this, what it made me think about, not a photograph, but a famous painting by Edward Hopper. And I, I think you'll agree that as different as they are in a different medium, it captures that kind of late night, everyone else is asleep and we're still out here kind of feeling. So now we're gonna go south of the border and uh, this is my native country, Mexico, and we're going way back to the 30s. Manuel Alvarez Bravo isn't always thought of as a street photographer. And yet I would argue that when you look at certain images, you could say these really are, you know, not newsworthy images out in the streets that he bumped into. Um, the way he captures these men sitting at a counter is fascinating. Uh, comedor means dining room or, or dining hall. It's kind of a, a place to eat. Um, I, I almost have the feeling that they're probably having a drink more, more so than necessarily eating. But what's fun, of course, is that between this kind of metal curtain slightly closed and you know the light not coming in beyond there, uh, their heads are pretty much gone. So it's almost like this incredible funny set of men, kind of a headless men, right? I actually wrote a paper about this image. I love it. He calls it um, Que Pequeño Es El Mundo or How Small the World Is. Um, because there's almost this idea that there's about to be a chance encounter on the street between this woman carrying something and this man going by. Um, but what's funny is it's very ambiguous, right? You don't even know if they know each other. 
and it may be that they're just passing each other. But I think there's this wonderful, you know, dynamic between these small kind of moving figures and this, you know, very kind of, uh, you know, this, this wall that's kind of a very, you know, just a, a concrete wall with a door. And then what are probably these really wonderful flowing pieces of very white laundry. So you've got, you know, straight lines and you've got these wonderful flowing diagonals. And in the meantime, this, this wonderful interface of these two figures. And I thought I would include this one. Uh, Mario Algase is actually a Cuban artist, but he did a lot of work in Mexico. Uh, so this, he captures this wonderful image of a woman and she's carrying so much cotton candy uh, that you know, her head has been completely covered by the cotton candy. So, so there's again, it's funny that in the crouched ones, the, the Manuel Alvarez Bravo, the men's heads are gone. And in a way her head is gone here too. The use of you know this vertical little plant, you've got she standing very vertically, but then of course this big, big kind of bunch of cotton candy is, is beautifully diagonal. And then there's these kind of very horizontal, I think those might be wires, but look at the texture of that wall and, and all the detail that's captured. Now we're gonna go really far away. Fan Ho was born in Shanghai, but his family moved him to Hong Kong. Uh, and he, he was self-taught. He had a little brownie camera from the age of 14, and he just started moving around and going around and following people in Hong Kong. And he became kind of the most important photographer documenting Hong Kong in the 50s and 60s as it was starting to become kind of more of a commercial city. I think his images are breathtaking. Um, he looks very much for light and shadow and people moving and walking. And so don't tell me this isn't absolutely gorgeous. You've got, you know, these, these, um, the rails for these trolleys. And in the meantime, you've got this little rickshaw crossing with the big, big shadow here. And in the meantime, this, this little boy or girl crossing over there. I mean, just the perspective and the light and the shadow is, is gorgeous. Look at these, he calls these little women. I, again, he catches them in the process of walking near these stairs and this light, this wonderful light kind of flooding this interior. Breathtaking. Again, look at the light he captures. Um, this is a slum. It's, it's, it's very, very poor. And yet look how gorgeous this looks with this small figure back here, almost like, almost as if, um, you know, the light has fallen upon them. And these wonderful images of, he calls it out with mom and dad, people going upstairs, downstairs, and again, the shadow and the light. Daido Moriyama in Japan is a very different type of foot photographer um, because what he started doing in the 60s and beyond is working uh, in a way that was very grainy, very high contrast, and, and, and certainly very far from the aesthetic we just saw with Fan Ho. Uh, working for a magazine that only had about three issues total, but it was called Provoke. What he was looking for is um, this look. It's very grainy, it's very blurry, um, and the contrast between the black and the white are very extreme. So you don't have lots of subtle grays. And here he captures this image of a midnight accident in Tokyo. And what I thought I would compare that to is some of the work that Ouija did in the 1940s in New York, because Ouija, as you may remember, used to run around and try to find salacious stories of people either murdered, in car crashes and so on. 
But interestingly, what Moriyama was probably looking at is a series of works that Andy Warhol did in 1960s called Death and Disaster Series. A lot of you may know Andy Warhol, of course, for his, his Liz Taylors and Marilyns and all the celebrities. But you know, he didn't always just grab images of celebrities and happy things from the media. He also said, you know, the media is also full of horrible pictures of accidents. So he has these series in all sorts of colors of accidents. The most um, widely circulated and sold photograph by Moriyama is of this stray dog. And you might say, well, what's so interesting about that? Well, the reason the stray dog becomes important is because Moriyama saw the dog not only as himself, but as almost a symbol of Japanese identity at a time that Japan had lost the war, the US had occupied Japan, and it was felt that Japanese identity was starting to be lost by a lot of kind of Western values and consumerism. So the stray dog became almost a symbol of the Japanese trying to you know, go around and find themselves again. And of course, in the context of street photography, you could argue that it's also kind of the flaneur, but it's a stray dog also wandering the streets and seeing what they find. And this is an example of what Provoke magazine would, would, um, would want to do. Uh, this style called bokeh was all about being grainy and being especially blurry on the edges. So you might have a little bit more definition of these men in a midnight snack bar. Uh, but again, it has actually a lot of the qualities that we were seeing, if you remember in the William Klein, um, uh, where you've got, again, the cropping people are cut off, the image is kind of tilted, it's very blurry. It's almost like this just a, this little snapshot of these people. It creates a mood. And then I love this one where he, again, this is this kind of random moment on the streets. He captures these women in the back of a car. And again, you've got this blurriness, this kind of, you know, very, it, it looks very random, very haphazard. And I think that this one reminds me a great deal, I think you'll agree, uh, with the Gary Winogrand uh, that we showed last week. I mean, can you imagine the, the woman, <laughs> you almost think it's the same woman also with the hand up in a car, moving in the streets in this very kind of random haphazard moment. But you can see that the Winogrand is, is very crisp and very clear as far as the, the sharpness and the Moriyama is using again this kind of bokeh style. Let's move quickly to Portugal. Rui Pala is uh, born and raised in Lisbon. That's where he lives and works. Um, he works in black and white and, and captures the beauty of Lisbon, uh, some absolutely gorgeous aesthetics. Um, I love how as, as the woman goes up these stairs, you know, the pigeons are just flying all over the place. Here, he calls this street guard, guardian I love how the kitty looks larger than life, you know, cause he's so close up and, and kind of either eating or moving towards us. And then this man is going exactly in the opposite direction. Don't tell me this is in a special photograph because you've got the going down, you've got the kind of coming this way, going that way. In the backdrop, you know, in, you know, blurry, this, this is what we call shallow focus. The kitty is, is perfect, you know, you can see the kitty perfectly. And then as you go further beyond uh, the shallow focus means that these just become kind of this background of, you know, laundry being blown away up there. No, hopefully not blown away. Um, don't tell me this isn't gorgeous. One of the things about Lisbon is that a lot of the downtown pavement is what they call Portuguese pavement. It's all like tiles, like mosaic. 
and that's featured often in these photographs. And, and again, this is beautiful. It almost looks like just these silhouettes moving away from us. Um, very ghost-like with this kind of small uh, fog and, and light. And I, uh, this reminded me a bit to the Andre Kertesz uh, of our rainy day in Place de la Concorde that we saw last time. Rui Pala goes to the underground. Um, something that's been said about his photography is that there's something a, a little bit mournful, a little bit sad, and it almost looks like the sound of the fados. It, fados are these kind of beautiful, sad laments that are kind of the cornerstone of Portuguese music. And you can actually find in YouTube Rui Pala photographs being shown with a fado in the background. And it kind of gives you that, that incredible mood that's a little bit mournful and sad. Alex Webb is a highly uh, recognized, awarded um, photographer that's worked for National Geographic and Time and the New York Times. Uh, but his street photography is quite remarkable. And, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about photographers that are moving around the world. He's an American, but he, he's photographed places, you know, all over the world. Um, his photography is incredibly rich in color, and it also has a lot of ambiguity. Uh, look at how many different kind of planes and kids are, 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 are here. Um, smack in the middle of the composition is this spinning blue uh, ball that almost looks like a globe. And then you've got this boy here, and then this boy there, and that little boy there. So it almost feels like you've got lots of different levels of depth. Um, it, it's remarkable, right? I, I mean, it, it almost, it, it, you almost wonder, is that how I see when I see a place like that? And of course the blues of the church and the blues of, of the ball and of the kids clothing mimic and, 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 and synergize with each other are kind of in sync. This image is, is really clever too, because this very blue wall um, has little figures drawn, you know, painted on it. And yet at the same time, again, you've got another wall back there with a man standing there. This little boy coming into our space almost looks like he's coming out of the wall as if the little painted figures are starting to walk towards us. So, so some, are, some are real people, some are not. And there's this incredible interplay. She's coming that way, he's coming this way, she's going that way. I think this is amazing. And this is what makes I think a street photograph special, right? Here, you've got all this cotton candy and incredible color in Mexico City's Zócalo. And, um, and again, you've got kind of the rickshaw and the little girl and the taxi and, and there's just so much going on, but it captures this beautiful moment with very, very rich color. And then finally for him, um, this was taken in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, again, how funny that you again have a figure painted on the wall and th that kind of competes with the real people walking by. And you've got this interesting, you know, light post basically almost like breaking up the photo into parts. And this frankly made me think of the Lee Friedlander we saw last week. Um, look at how he's walking by just the way she is. He's kind of going in that direction and the composition is broken up by this door in this case. Maciej Dakowicz is a Polish photographer. He actually also does a lot of traveling and gives workshops. You can go to his workshops and you know, meet up with him in India or somewhere like that, and he'll teach you street photography. Um, when we look at a photograph here he took in, in one of many, 
if you go to his website, there's a lot of wonderful, colorful photographs in India and Vietnam and Bangladesh and elsewhere. Um, look at this photograph. Um, it's full of color, but not only that, he crops it in such a way that you've got just someone's feet, someone's upper body, someone's arm, this man kind of walking by, and this one interestingly covered, it's almost like half of his body is covered. And I think that's what makes it so interesting. If he had been standing you know, 100 feet further back and you saw all these people in a busy market, it might look busy, but it's not quite as interesting. So that I think is why he teaches street photography. It's about finding ways to make things really much more compelling. Or in this one, he's in the holy city of Varanasi uh, on the banks of the river Ganges and the fishermen are fixing their nets. And, you know, he sees these interesting steps and all these dogs running. And, you know, this, this man kind of there and, and this, this little boy. And you see, it reminds me almost of that idea of this being a stage, almost like that's where the decisive moment is happening, the doggies are running, in the way Cartier-Bresson found in Madrid in 1933, that's the stage, and then this person in the front, this little kid, is kind of reminding us that, you know, we are spectators looking into this stage. And talk about a decisive moment, he captures this ball. This, this ball just flew away from these kids. The little girl and the boy are like, oh my God, our ball went away. And what's wild is it looks like this game of backgammon is about to be disrupted terribly. And I just hope the kids weren't yelled out too badly or reprimanded. So now let's talk about a few artists that are working very recently and with their smartphones. And, and they are proof that, you know, you can actually take some really wonderful images with a smartphone, but it's all about looking and finding and, and being good at how you frame and who you find. And Dina Alfasi is a woman that has a two hour commute in Israel on a bus and on a train. And she decided, I'm gonna take wonderful photographs of the commuters. So she captures this woman here, kind of looking out. I wish my commutes involved nice uh, palm trees, right? Um, but um, her photography captures the diversity of Israel. But look at the incredible image she captures just with her smartphone. This little boy pointing you know, at the window and the reflection coming through. It, it's a beautiful image this woman kind of looking off off of the frame it's it's really kind of a beautiful image portrait and and of course i wanted to compare this to those candid photographs that walker evans had taken of subway passengers with a hidden little contacts camera because it really is about almost commuter portraiture again um and 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 seeing people relax or ponder or reflect and, and without them knowing it. I, I wanted to just kind of acknowledge that there's a new book just from March 2021 of women street photographers. Um, I think this is great. Women in the art world have often gotten kind of the less recognition than men and anything that promotes women in the arts and in photography is key. And, and this has about a hundred different women photographers in, in it. And I thought I would just show you two examples. This wonderful image uh, taken by a Finnish woman, Anu Esko. Uh, she, she saw this bus, this very yellow bus going by in Russia. 
and she saw that a woman was kind of looking at her and she was looking at the woman and they almost had like this little moment. So I think there's something really precious about that because it's, it's almost like human beings connected um, as one is about to go, go away in her bus. And then these kids playing um, by Haley Jeon, a, a South Korean uh, artist. Another uh, artist, now we're moving to Africa, working with a smartphone, Girma Berta. Uh, what he does, which is fascinating, is you know he takes snapshots of people in his city of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia with a smartphone. And so they are kind of like decisive moments of people just moving, but then using computer graphics, he removes the entire background and just gives the background this beautiful monochrome color. And he's got them in purples and greens and blues. And I have to say they're very, very special. And one of the questions we're gonna ask is, you know, is this still street photography? And, you know, part of it is, part of it maybe not so much. Um, I think it's a, a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful work. We're gonna close with a couple of artists that I thought I would put in to be a little bit provocative and to ask the question, you know, is this still street photography? Because they're taking photographs of people on streets and yet they're using particular manipulations or processes to do so that might raise the question, you know, is this still street photography? And Philip Lorca de Corsha in his series Heads, let's read the quote. He says, pictures are usually a reflection of the person who produced them. In the Heads series, I wanted as far as possible to fade out my presence as the photographer. So what he did in a place like Times Square is he set up a camera and a flash with a sensor way above people and where they go by. So he's not even with the camera, the camera's up there. The sensor alone is when these people arrive at a certain place is going to shoot the photograph with the flash going off. And what he creates then is these images that are highly cinematic. I mean, they look like this person who's basically just in the middle of busy, busy Times Square is suddenly almost like a protagonist of a movie, right? Um, this young woman, maybe she's a tourist in Times Square with her family. Suddenly the light is on her. She is a superstar. Look at this young woman. I mean, it's amazing the, the way the, the wind is kind of making her hair blow and you wonder what she's thinking about. And again, all it is, is someone walking around in Times Square and Philip Lorca de Corsha wasn't even the one that had to, you know, click on the camera. It was done by a sensor. And what's interesting about this man is, it turned out his name is Mr. Neusenzweig. Um, uh, he is uh, an Orthodox conservative Jewish man that basically took Lorca de Corsha uh, to a trial because he said, you know, how dare you um, just take my photograph without my consent and it's being sold in books. And by the way, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court of New York and Philip Lorca de Corsha actually won uh, based on the, the idea that this was really for artistic expression. It was not for advertising purposes or for like purely commercial purposes. So I'm sure Mr. News and so I wasn't happy with that, but uh, this stands as an important landmark case that set precedent for issues of consent when you're taking photographs of people on streets. We're almost done. Matthew Pillsbury was born in, in France, but uh, came to New York and does a lot of his work out of New York now. Um, what he does is he finds a really interesting place somewhere, and then he uses what we call long exposure. Um, you know, long exposures way back in the 19th century were considered a bad thing. Um, 
the cameras could only take long exposures. And so to get vivid, sharp images of people, you actually had to like tell them to sit there and not move for three, five, 10 minutes. And he's doing the opposite now, even though cameras can take pictures very quickly with perfect precision, he wants to benefit from the long exposure. And he has already learned and learned how long he needs to keep the, the camera, uh, the, the aperture open to, to get the amount of movement and blurriness and sense of, of all the people in this case that were looking at the Mona Lisa at the Louvre. So he's purposely, um, instead of giving us that, just that split second is actually seeing, making us see how time goes by and all the people and all the movement. I think it's absolutely amazing work. Now the question again becomes, is this street photography? Um, it's not a decisive moment. It, it's a decisive five minutes. Is it the accumulation of a lot of little decisive moments that were captured by the long exposure of a cam camera? What is it? And again, look at, these are beautiful. This is at a protest right here near my house in Columbus Circle. Um, and look at how beautiful that looks with kind of all the movement and all the people and, 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 and almost the sense that, you know, reality really isn't a frozen photograph. Reality looks more like this. This really captures the passage of time and movement. And finally, um, this photographer from Denmark decided to stand at the same corner of 42nd Street and Vanderbilt right by Grand Central, there he is, and photograph people commuting from 8.30 to 9 a.m. or 9.30 a.m., uh, you know, going to work. But the thing is, what makes it interesting is he did that for nine years. And so when he went back and looked at all, at all of his negatives, he could see the same people walking to work years and years later. So it becomes this really funny, almost visual study of commuters over time. Um, it's kind of uncanny. He clearly likes his cold Starbucks coffee. He clearly likes Ralph Lauren. And years can go by and it's the same daily rituals of going to work. She happens to be a very happy morning person, certainly happier than I was. Look at how she's wearing red, despite this being probably years later. He's wearing his blue, he's wearing his earphones. A really fun book that he calls 42nd and Vanderbilt. And again, the question is, is this street photography? In summary, um, we, we've looked at photography for decades and decades across lands. And what's interesting is that some really common subject matter keeps pre cropping up, right? Um, people walking, people moving, of course, because that's what you see on streets. People commuting on public transport. So whether you're in Israel or Portugal or Russia, People are on buses, they're on trains, and that is a really common theme. And the, of course, the other thing that happens on the streets, fortunately, is people at leisure, people enjoying their time out and about. And I'm gonna leave you just with some questions to consider. When you're looking at street photography, there's some interesting things to think about. Is the artist taking the photograph an insider like Fan Ho in his own Hong Kong, or are they an outsider like Robert Frank was, you know, a Swiss man going around the United States? Is the work kind of personal, like a personal time capsule of the artist, or is it a bit more objective and conceptual like these commuters that we just saw? What about the relationship of the artist with who he's photographing you know, Deanne Arbus was known for speaking and hanging out and getting to know her sitters, whereas Lorca de Corsha in Times Square said, 
I'm not even speaking to these people. I'm not even taking the photograph. It's a sensor. And then there's this idea of, you know, is it kind of a very unmanipulated shot that's just the truth and nothing but the truth? Or did I use long exposures? Did I look at people over time? Did I use interesting um, things like a certain shallow focus or other devices that are gonna give me a certain mood or a certain look? And with that, I'll just say, um, if you can, please join me at the next talk. It's gonna be in three weeks, uh, May 19th, 2021 at 6 p.m. We're gonna look at this idea of community immersion. So this time we're gonna talk about photographers that really were photographing their own world or spending world inside the world of either bikers or prison inmates or revelers at Studio 54 or kids at a high school and really kind of documenting a community but as an insider. If you would like to write a review on Yelp, that would be highly appreciated. You can find Look at New York Art in New York. If you want to, I certainly welcome your donation at my GoFundMe page. It's called Promote Art Education, Support Look at New York Art. And then of course, as always, when we can go back into art galleries in groups, I would love to take you um, on a tour of art galleries in New York. You can find me at Look at New York Art. Um, and thanks again for your time. I hope you enjoyed this talk.